And welcome everyone and good Sabbath to you. Next Wednesday is the fifth annual holy day of the year. It's the Day of Atonement, known in Hebrew as John Kippur. Now that's October 5th, 2022, and that's just four days from today. Wow, we're moving right along. Of course, we'll be right here at 1.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, our usual time for the Day of Atonement, God willing. We long for the time when Christ defeats his enemies, including Satan, when he cleanses the world of sin. Now, this is not a light thing to do. Of course, Trumpets announces the return of Jesus Christ. Although it might be difficult for us to believe, there are those who will not want Christ to return. I suppose seem, some seem to enjoy their sin just way too much. Today, sin abounds, and it's even encouraged. Well, that will change when Christ returns, but it won't exactly be instantaneous. There will be those who will fight against Christ. But on the Day of Atonement, things will change. The forces opposing Jesus Christ will be defeated. Satan himself will no longer be the ruler of this world. He will no longer be able to influence mankind as he has for thousands of years. It will remain that way too for well the next 1,000 years anyway. When times are really tough, what do our Bibles instruct us to do? One thing is to pray. Another is to fast. You might remember that the demon that the disciples could not cast out of that man, that was a real problem. Now, Jesus told his disciples that this one required much prayer and fasting to expel. Today, let's take a look at what the Bible says about fasting as we prepare for our fast on the Day of Atonement. We'll also look at what science has to say about fasting. For time is serious as the Day of Atonement, we need to pray and fast. We need to humble ourselves and come closer to God. There are many times we probably should fast, but on the Day of Atonement, God requires His people to fast. In fact, the Day of Atonement is the only day of the year that we're actually commanded to fast. That's just how important that day is. The rest of the year, it's kind of up to us to decide when we need to fast. Now, God's command to fast on the Day of Atonement is found in both Leviticus and Numbers. But if you would, let's go ahead and begin by turning to Leviticus chapter 23. Let's Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 26. Now, by the way, here are five verses in the Bible that tell us to fast on the Day of Atonement. You might want to write these down if you want to look at them later, but here they are. Here's five for you. I've got Leviticus 16, verses 29 and 31. Leviticus 23, verses 27 and 32. And also Numbers, chapter 29, verse 7. And of course, it's not just fasting that's required on the Day of Atonement. Let's look at Leviticus 23, again beginning in verse 26. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Also, on the tenth day of the seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation to you. Well, on the day of atonement, we're told we should have a holy convocation. We know that a holy convocation means that God's people are to assemble on this day. Convocation also means rehearsal, according to Strong's Dictionary. So, we're to rehearse this day on God's calendar, as we do on his other holy days. Let's continue in verse 27. And you shall afflict your souls. This, we believe, means that we're to fast for the 24-hour period of this high holy day. We'll look more at that later. But if you look down at verse 32, we read, You shall afflict your souls in the ninth day of the month at even. From even to even shall you celebrate your Sabbath. So this year we're to fast from, well, basically sundown Tuesday night until sundown on Wednesday night. So, verse 28. And you shall do no work in that same day, for it is a day of atonement, to make an atonement for you before the Lord your God. The day of atonement is a day when no work is to be done. Instead, assembly, prayer, and fasting is in order. Now, God's serious about this. Verse 29. 
For whatsoever soul it shall be that shall not be afflicted in that same day, he shall be cut off from among his people. And whatsoever soul it be that does any work in that same day, the same soul will I destroy from among his people. You shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. It shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest. You shall afflict your souls. In the ninth day of the month at even, from even unto even, shall you celebrate your Sabbath. Sort of fast for the entire 24 hours from sunset to sunset, as we read just a few moments ago. I believe most of us understand how to get together with other brethren on the Sabbath to assemble ourselves to have a holy confiscation. I think most of us understand that we're not to do any work on the Day of Atonement. That's why today I'd like to address, address fasting on the Day of Atonement and fasting actually in general. Well, I went and looked for a definition of fasting at thefreedictionary.com. I was expecting a simple definition of the word, but ended up with a bit more than I expected. So let me read what I found for the definition of fasting at thefreedictionary.com. You can check this out for yourselves. Here is their definition of fasting. It said, Fasting is voluntarily not eating food for varying lengths of time. Fasting is used as a medical therapy for many conditions. It is also a spiritual practice in many religions. Now, below the dictionary's definition, it listed a purpose for fa fasting. I thought this was a little odd, but let me read that to you. It said purpose. <clears throat> fasting can be used for nearly every chronic condition, including allergies, anxiety, arthritis, asthma, depression, diabetes, headaches, heart disease, high cholesterol, low blood sugar, digestive disorders, mental illness, and obesity. Fasting is an effective and safe way to lose weight. Close quote. Well, to tell you the truth, I've rarely had any luck dieting to lose weight. But earlier this year, I did try intermittent fasting with good results. Now, I've not been as diligent as I should be the last few weeks, but it does work if you do it anyway, at least for me. And it really wasn't as difficult as I thought it might be. But let's get back to the article. Okay, here's what it says, continuing. Fasting is frequently prescribed as a detoxification treatment for those with conditions that may be influenced by environmental factors, such as cancer and multiple chemical sensitivity. Fasting has been used successfully to help treat people who have been exposed to high level of toxic materials due to accident or occupation. Fasting is thought to be beneficial as a preventative measure to increase overall health, vitality, and resistance to disease. Fasting is also used as a method of mental and spiritual rejuvenation. End quote. So again, what is fasting? Well, fasting is basically choosing not to eat or eating sparingly or abstaining from food for a period of time. It could include, it could include water as well. The fasting differs from starvation, and the starvation is prolonged to the point of death. Starvation is usually unintentional, where fasting is actually a choice. During fasting, the body use, uses stored energy in the blood, liver, and fat cells to continue its, continue its function. During starvation, the body has already depleted the reserved energy in the blood, liver, and fat cells and begins using muscle and organs for energy. Now, that's not a good situation. But fasting can be a very healthy practice. Of course, starvation is a very unhealthy situation. In 2019, the National Institute of uh, Aging published that researchers have been looking into fasting as a valid treatment, again, for type 2 diabetes, high cholesterol, obesity, and even cancers and neurological disorders such as Alzheimer's disease. Fasting helps overcome insulin resistance and plateaus in weight loss. Fasting can force the body into using stored fuel in the fat cells and liver to continue its regular function, like we said. In fact, cognitive function, learning, memory, and alertness are all increased by fasting because of fat stores, when converted to energy, stimulate the production of a protein called BDNF. Now that stands for 
brain-derived neurotropic factor. You might want to look that up. It's brain-derived neurotropic factor. And BDNF is needed for the regeneration of nerve and brain cells. We also find that fasting triggers autophagy, where diseased and damaged cells are removed from the body. So fasting can actually be a very healthy practice. Of course, doctors do caution individuals who have a history of eating disorders, women who may be pregnant or nursing, or individuals who are underweight or malnourished, should consult with a doctor before fasting. There may be other maladies as well, but uh, some of us may be already afflicted, if you will, to some degree. Some of us might need to take certain medic, uh, medications each day with at least a little bit of food. And it might not be a bad idea to consult with our doctors anyway about fasting. But there are some health benefits to fasting if we're careful as we go about it. But what about the spiritual benefits of fasting? We're interested in that for sure. Well, if the brain is being regenerated by D BDNF, cognitive function, learning, memory and alertness are actually increased. This increase in brain function may make an individual more able to comprehend a passage in the scriptures, or uh, maybe it'll make them more receptive to communication from the Holy Spirit. Often, hearing from God is best described as a communication in the brain and not the ears at all. Fasting also reminds us just how fragile our existence really is and how much we do rely on the Father for our very life. Our food and drink come from Him. Actually, our every breath comes from Him. And fasting, at times, also frees up our time for Bible study and prayer. And when fasting, I'm often reminded of just how much time is spent on preparing, consuming, and cleaning up after consuming food. It really adds up. During fasting, the time normally spent dedicated to food can be used for prayer and study. Now, obviously, we need nourishment we receive by eating. We can't just stop eating forever, don't get me wrong. But occasional fasting can actually have health benefits, so we don't need to be afraid of fasting for health reasons. We also see that fasting can strengthen us spiritually. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 4, if you would. Let's get to the spiritual aspect of this. It's Matthew chapter 4. We'll start in verse 1. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. And this was right after Jesus was baptized and the Holy Spirit descended on him. You remember that? They go on the story. And then, of course, Jesus fasted in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights and then was tempted by the devil. Remember, the devil tested Jesus three times, and each time, Jesus overcame him. Matthew 4, verse 1. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward hungry. But the body is beautifully designed by God to burn stored energy or fat during extended periods of not eating. It's designed for that. Verse 3. When the tempter came to him, he said, If you be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Well, bread would, have, of course, be very tempting to Jesus because he was sure he was very, very hungry. It took incredible self-control, which is one of the fruits of the Spirit, by the way, for Jesus to decline at this point. But the devil knew Jesus would at least be tempted. Verse 4. But he, Jesus, answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into the holy city and set him on a pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you be the Son of God, cast yourself down, for it is written, the devil's quoting scripture to Jesus, He shall give his angels charge concerning you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest at any time you dash your foot against the stone. But this was taken out of context. Verse 7. Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Verse 8. Again, the devil took him up into an exceeding high mountain, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them, and said to him, all these things will I give you, if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Get you hence, Satan, for it is written, 
You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. So I'll say this is not only an example of a power of learning Scripture, but also an example of the power of prayer and fasting. Satan is a very formidable foe. Jesus was empowered to overcome him by prayer, fasting, no doubt. He just fasted for 40 days. And knowing the Word of God. Next, let's look at Matthew chapter 9. It's Matthew chapter 9 and four, uh, verse 14. That's just five chapters ahead, I believe. Matthew 9, verse 14. Jesus and his disciples were being watched closely by the Pharisees and the disciples of John. Now, Jesus' disciples were different for some reason. Let's see how. Again, Matthew 9, verse 14. Then came to him, Jesus, the disciples of John, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples fast not? Apparently, Jesus' disciples weren't fasting or at least not very often. And this seemed to be different from the other religious types. The disciples of John fasted often. The Pharisees fasted often. But it seems Jesus' disciples really weren't fasting. Well, why not? I think the answer is in verse 15. And Jesus said to them, Can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them, and then they shall fast. Jesus predicted that his disciples would fast, but maybe not yet. Jesus was still with them. They would fast when Jesus was taken away. When a person's grieving, they often don't think of eating. And fasting actually helps heal a person during mourning or grief. Turn over to 2 Samuel, if you would. 2 Samuel 12, verse 14, for an unusual situation, I think, in the Bible. 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 15. Remember when David and Bathsheba's first child was born? Do you remember that? The child became very ill and died. How did David react to the child's illness and his death? Well, as the child was ill, he mourned. But David's reaction to the situation was maybe a little unusual. Let's take a look at that story. Again, that's 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 15. And Nathan departed unto his house. And the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bore unto David, and it was very sick. David therefore besought God for the child, and David fasted. And went in and lay all night upon the earth. And the elders of his house arose and went to him to raise him up from the earth, but he would not. Neither did he eat bread with them. The elders noticed that David was fasting. They tried to get him to eat. Verse 18. And it came to pass on the seventh day that the child died. Now David had been fasting for seven days. And the servants of, the day of David feared to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we spake unto him, and he would not hearken unto our voice. How will he then vex himself if we tell him that the child is dead? The elders were worried that if David fasted and grieved that much when the child was alive, his response to the child's death would be even worse. They may have feared David might even hurt himself. Verse 19. But... But when David saw that his servants whispered, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore David said unto his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his apparel and came then to the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he came to his own house, and when he required, they set bread before him, and he did eat. Well, no one told David the child had died. He perceived it by their behavior. Of course, they told him the answer to that question when he asked them. But as soon as David realized the child was dead, he basically ended his fast. And that was probably unusual behavior for a person who was grieving. Why did he do this? 
Seems unusual. Uh, let's look at verse 21. Then his servants said to him, What thing is this that you've done? You did fast and weep for the child while it was alive. But when the child was dead, you did rise and eat bread. Here's his answer. And he said, While the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, Who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. David fasted because he believed that it was possible that God would be merciful and heal the child. But David's fast didn't quite work that way. It was not God's will that this child would live. In fact, David had already been told by the prophet Nathan that the child would die. Yet he continued to pray and fast anyway. But that's not my point. The point is that it's unusual for a person to end a fast when they begin to grieve over a death of a loved one. When people are grieving, they often won't desire food, just as Jesus' disciples would not fast while the bridegroom was with them, but would fast when he was taken away, when they were in grief. So it's unusual for someone to want to eat when they were grieving. David's servants and housemates expressed surprise to see a meat after a child actually died. But fasting can actually help a person through grief. Well, weeping takes a good deal of energy, and a person can feel exhausted afterward. They may simply want to rest. Grief can remove a person's appetite. So I guess fasting then is a natural response. Fasting can also prepare us, prepare us to be used by God in miraculous ways. Turn to John, I got that wrong, turn to Mark. Let's get it right. Mark chapter 9, verse 14. That's Mark chapter 9, verse 14. You know, I think Jesus explained one of the benefits of fasting to the disciples in this passage of Scripture. Now, this is actually the story of one of the failures of the disciples. When the disciples failed here, Jesus went on to teach them how to correct their mistake, I believe. Again, that's Mark chapter 9, verse 14. You probably remember this story. Mark chapter 9, verse 14. And when he came to his disciples, he saw a great multitude about them, and the scribes questioning with them. And straightway all the people, when they beheld him, were greatly amazed and running to him, saluted him. And he asked the scribes, What question you with him? And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought to you my son, which has a dumb spirit. This man was, his son was apparently possessed. And wheresoever he, wheresoever he takes him, he tears him, and he foams and gnashes with his teeth and pines away. And I spoke to your disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. This man possessed, well, this man brought his demon-possessed son to the disciples to cast out the demon. The disciples failed. They couldn't do it. Why did they fail? Why could they not cast out that demon? Verse 19. This is Jesus, he says. He answered them and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him to me. Well, Jesus said they lack faith. He also said something to the effect of, How long am I going to put up with you guys? <laughs> That's what he really said. Uh, how long shall I suffer you? Anyway, bring him to me. Verse 20, bring him to me. And they brought him, the boy, unto him, Jesus. And when he saw him, straightway the spirit tarried him. And he said, he fell on the ground and wallowed foaming. And he, Jesus, asked his father, How long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, Of a child. And oftentimes it has cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. This father was desperate. For years, he tried everything to help his son, and nothing had worked. Even the disciples weren't able to help. I'm sure some parents today can probably identify with that. Have we ever been desperate? We tried everything, but it seemed that nothing worked. 
Well, it seems like, as always, Jesus is the answer. Verse 23. Jesus said to him, If you can believe, all things are possible to him that believes. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. I've heard that before. The father cried out to Jesus, help me. In almost the same breath, he said, I believe, but help me with my unbelief. We seem to often have both at the same time, both belief and unbelief. I think we probably understand what I'm talking about here, but let's go on to verse 25. Verse 25. When Jesus saw that the people were running, came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying to him, You dumb and deaf spirit, I charge you, come out of him and enter no more into him. And the spirit cried and rent him sore and came out of him, and he was as one dead, insomuch that many said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. So he wasn't dead. So, Jesus was successful where his disciples were not. Well, now for the lessons I talked about for the disciples. Verse 28. After this, And when he came into the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could not we cast him out? And he said to them, This kind can come forth by nothing but prayer and fasting. Fasting. Jesus used the situation to teach the disciples a valuable lesson about the benefits of prayer and fasting. It seems that some demons are particularly strong. These strong demons were somewhat resistant even to the authority of Jesus Christ himself. But fasting and prayer can allow our human weaknesses to be overcome by God's Holy Spirit so we can be fully obedient to God and be used more effectively by Him to achieve His purposes. Fasting can also be an act of repentance. The people of Nineveh fasted 40 days after Jonah's testimony. They repented and fasted and prayed to communicate their sincerity to God. Of course, God had mercy on them and did not send the judgment he had originally planned. You let us turn next to Joel. Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2 and verse 12. That's Joel chapter 2 verse 12. Now, Joel calls the people to repent and fast in an attempt to convince God not to send judgment. This passage in Joel is after the description of the day of the Lord and how terrible it will be. Joel 2, verse 12. Therefore also now, says the Lord, turn you even to me with all your heart and with fasting. Notice the word fasting here. And with weeping and with mourning. And rend or tear your heart and not your garments. Now, tearing the garments was an act of extreme grief and distress, basically communicating that the situation was hopeless. But God didn't want them to tear their garments as a sign of grief and hopelessness. He wanted them to truly grieve over their sin, tearing their hearts. He tells them not to tear their garments. The situation was not hopeless. Not if they truly repented, and the Lord might forgive them and provide a blessing rather than a curse. Again, verse 13. And rend your heart and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repents him of the evil. Of the evil. <clears throat> Who knows if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, and those that suck the breasts. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber, and the bride out of her closet. Everyone's called to repentance. Young and old, men and women, even the new bride and bridegroom should gather with the others to fast and repent. Verse 17. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar, and let them say, Spare your people, O Lord, and give not your heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them, 
Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? We can see that fasting can be used as a form of repentance. What else can fasting do? Well, fasting and prayer as a nation is a way to respond to a national crisis. Now, Esther asked the people to fast for three days and nights, I believe, before she risked her life to speak to the king on behalf of her nation. All of Israel fasted for seven days to mourn the death of King Saul. The death of the king and his son Jonathan in battle was a time, of course, of national crisis. Jehoshaphat proclaimed the fast throughout all of Judah when the Ammonites came against them and he prayed for God's intervention in battle. And Ezra proclaimed a fast when the Israelites were returning from exile, seeking God's protection from enemies along the way. Fasting had become commonplace during the reign of Jehoiakim, I'll get it right, Jehoiakim, king of Judah. He proclaimed a national fast in the ninth month. But let's turn to Isaiah chapter 58, if you would. Isaiah chapter 58. You know, there's some out there that seem to do things that are not sincere. Uh, Some like to pray a lot or whatever, and you wonder if they're sincere. But anyway, I wanted to point out, again, Isaiah chapter 58, it'll be verse 1. I want to point out that, remember that God is not pleased with fasting or anything else that's not genuine. People can fast to show repentance, to show repentance but not actually repent. Isaiah had a message from God about what I call fake fasting. Again, Isaiah chapter 58, verse 1. This is what he said. Cry aloud, spare not. Lift up your voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinance of justice. They take delight in approaching to God. Well, these people have at least been going through the motions of devotion to God. They seem to pray daily and take pride in doing so. They read the scriptures and outwardly keep the laws of God, but God's not pleased with them. Why not? Let's see in verse 3. Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and you see not? Wherefore, we've afflicted our soul, and you take no knowledge. The people are are asking God, didn't we do everything right? Didn't you see us fast? You didn't even notice. What was God's answer? Continuing in verse 3. Behold, in the day of your fast you find pleasure, and exact all your labors. Now, exact all your labors basically means to drive or tyrannize the laborers you're you're overseeing. These people were not working because they were fasting, but they were also driving their employees to work even harder than usual while they fasted and rested. Verse 4. Behold, you fast for strife and debate and to smite with the fist of wickedness. You shall not fast as you do this day to make your voice to be heard on high. The word translated as strife is a Hebrew word reeb, and it really means a contest. And the word translated as debate is the Hebrew word matzah, which means quarrel or debate. These people were fasting as a contest to see who could fast longest or the best. They were not fasting as an act of repentance, as they wanted the people to believe. And God was not pleased. He did not buy it. Okay, verse 5. Is it such a fast that I have chosen? A day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast and an acceptable day to the Lord? The answer to these rhetorical questions is obviously no. God is more interested in the condition of the heart than just mechanically keeping a fast or mechanically doing anything else. Verse 6. Is not this the fast that I have chosen, to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke. And notice in verse 8 coming up that fasting is associated with healing. I thought that was interesting. So verse 8, then shall your light break forth as the morning, and your health 
shall spring forth speedily. And your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rearward. The kind of fast that God desires involves a change of heart. God wants the leaders to focus on treating those with, under their leadership with justice. As he said, loosen the chains of sin, release their burdens, break off their yokes, and let them go free. These are the, thing, the things that Jesus does for us when we repent. He releases us from the burdens of sin and sets us free. And that's what fasting as an act of repentance is supposed to reflect. True repentance of sin. The result is freedom and life. No, God will not reward fake fasting or fake repentance. He knows the heart. Turn next to Jeremiah chapter 14. That's Jeremiah chapter 14, and we'll look at verse 10. Jeremiah 14, verse 10. Now, Jeremiah has a bad report to give to the people. Here God's seen their sins and will no longer listen even to their prayers. They fast and pray, but they've not repented. They refuse to obey God. Again, Jeremiah 14, verse 10. Thus says the Lord unto this people, Thus have they loved to wonder. They have not refrained their feet, therefore the God does not accept them. He will now remember their iniquity and visit their sins. Then said the Lord unto me, Jeremiah, Pray not for this people for their good. Wow. Jeremiah was instructed not to pray for good things to happen to these people. Apparently, they needed to suffer some negative consequences for their sins. And for their no, not, you know, they, didn't, they weren't generally repenting. And perhaps that's the only way they would repent. Verse 12, he says, When they fast, I will not hear their cry. When they offer a burnt offering and an oblation, I will not accept them but I will consume them by the sword and by famine and by the pestilence. Well, clearly the actual fasting was not a problem here. But God's not telling us to refrain from pa uh, fasting in this pa uh, passage. He's telling us that our repentance needs to be genuine. Our fasting needs to be genuine. I'm afraid that's where this country is today. You know, today, so many people cry out to God. They actually fast. They pray. They read their Bibles. But they refuse to repent. They refuse to obey the commandments of God. We've often talked about pastors who are telling their congregations not to bother to keep God's commandments. Maybe sword, famine, and pestilence will be what it takes to truly turn people back to God today. And that's exactly what's prophesied to happen, as it did in the past. What's that saying? Those who forget the past are doomed to repeat it. Now, here we go. Unfortunately, according to the book of Revelation, some, were stub some will stubbornly refuse to repent even then, even with that happening. Well, Though regular fasting is customary and expected in the Bible, the only fast specifically commanded by God is the fast on the Day of Atonement. We saw that earlier. Let's turn over, if you would, to Ezra chapter 8. That's Ezra chapter 8, and we'll look at verse 21. Ezra chapter 8, verse 21. You know, for years, I was always told that the phrase, afflict your souls, meant to fast. But no one ever really showed me that. Let's see if we can make that uh, claim here in the Bible. Excuse me. Now, earlier, I mentioned that Ezra declared a fast and prayed for safe passage from the people returning to Israel from exile. They don't want to ask the king for help with that. Let's take a look at that. Again, that's Ezra 8, verse 21, and see how that story went. Ezra 8, verse 21. Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahaba, that we might afflict ourselves before God. Oh, well, there you go. You're proclaiming a fast for what reason? To afflict themselves before God. To seek of him, okay, that we might afflict ourselves before our God, to seek of him a right way for us and for our little ones and for all our substance. 
For I was ashamed to require of the king a band of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy in the way. Well, why, did, why were they hesitant to ask for help? Why do they not want to help ask the king for his army to protect them? Well, let's see. Because we'd spoken unto the king, saying, The hand of our God is upon all them for good that seek him. But his power and his wrath is against all them that forsake him. So they didn't want to make God look bad. They were going to let God take care of it, but they were going to fast. So verse 23. So we fasted and besought our God for this, and he was entreated of us. Or as a good uh, God's word version puts it, so we fasted and asked God for a safe journey, and he answered our prayer. Ezra and the people fasted and prayed that God would grant them safe passage back to their promised land so that Ezra would not have to ask for protection from the king. They traveled with silver and gold and vessels needed for the temple. Ezra was concerned that they'd be robbed or maybe even killed along the way, and rightly so. Ezra told the king that the hand of God would be upon them because they sought him, and he didn't want the, and he didn't want the king to think God would not do as he promised. But God did protect them on their journey. No soldiers were required of the king. This passage in Ezra defines fasting as afflicting one's soul. So I think that's a good example. Also, uh, we looked at this earlier, I think, but Isaiah 58, verse 3, I'm not going to go there, but Isaiah 58, verse 3 says, I'll read this to you. Wherefore have we fasted? Wherefore have we afflicted our soul? So again, uh, fasting basically is what afflicting our souls mean. Afflicting our soul meaning body, of course, nephesh, okay? If you would, let's turn back to Leviticus 23. We're just there earlier, but Leviticus 23, verse 29. That's Leviticus 23, verse 29, just for a moment. Now, this afflicting one's soul, or fasting on the day of appointment, of day of atonement, is very important. Let's read this verse again just to see how important it is. This is about the day of atonement. We read about it earlier. For whatsoever soul it be, that shall not be afflicted in that same day, he shall be cut off from among his people. If a person refuses to fast on the tenth day of the seventh month, they shall be cut off from among his people. Doesn't sound good, does it? Well, but what does that mean? Cut off from among his people. The Hebrew word translated into the English phrase, cut off from among his people, that whole phrase is the Hebrew word h 3772, it's Kareth, or Karath. This refers to a covenant ceremony. In that ceremony, the sacrificial animal was literally cut in half, and the partners in the covenant would walk between the pieces. The animal was then cooked and eaten, thus sealing the deal. But the passing between the pieces is depicted in the covenant between Abram and the Lord in Genesis 15, if you want to check that out. Being cut off from among his people indicated that the covenant was broken. When the covenant was broken by one party, the other party was no longer bound by the covenant. So God is saying here in Leviticus 23, verse 29, that if a person doesn't fast on the Day of Atonement, then the covenant between God and that person is broken. And God is released from keeping his terms of the covenant. So you can see this is some pretty serious business. So knowing, how, knowing just how important fasting is on the Day of Atonement, how do we prepare to fast correctly? I need to say this before I forget to mention it, but there are people that may not be able to completely fast with absolutely no food or water for the 24-hour period. Again, we need to check with our doctors about this probably, but again, we might have medication we need to take with a little food or something like that, and I believe that's perfectly acceptable. In some cases, uh, we may have to eat something uh, or we may get really sick. So, again, uh, God understands all this. But if everything's okay and there's no reason we can't fast, then we should. Or at least with the limitations that we have. So, if we prepare to fast, how do we go about that? Well, remember, the fast associated with the Day of Atonement in 2022 begins at sundown on Tuesday, October 4th. 
then continues until Wednesday, October 5th at sunset. After sunset, of course, on Wednesday, we may, we may break our fast. I recommend not eating a lot like I did the first time. I got sick because I ate so much. So take it easy when you come off that fast. But we need to know how to fast or what's some good tips on fasting. Now, the short fast of the Day of Atonement is a 24-hour dry fast. This means we eat no food and drink no water during this fast. To prepare for the fast, we want to make sure that we're well hydrated. And again, if we have wrong medication, malnourished, pregnant, nursing a baby, have a history of an eating disorder or anything else that might present a problem, we might need to modify our fast or forgo it altogether. In that case, like I said, we might already be afflicted. But again, do the best we can. God knows our heart, what we're trying to do. But we're not to injure ourselves, put it that way. In preparation for our fast, we might want to reduce our caffeine intake the week before. Or we could start now if we've not started already. Caffeine withdrawal can cause us to have headaches. So that may be something you want to limit uh, now. If we do experience a headache or dizziness during fasting, I'm told that taking a bath in warm water with Epsom salt can help. We also might take a nap and rest while fasting. Remember, atonement is a day of rest. We should be resting for the most part anyway. And we might need to ask for the day off from work from our employer, but it might be a little bit late for that right now. But And third, we probably need to know why we're fasting. The day of atonement and the great plan of God represents the time when God's great wrath has been poured out on all flesh and his great wrath is finally satisfied. At the end of the day, mankind will be at one with God. That's what atonement is, at one -ment. In order to be at one with God, first, sin must be dealt with. We fast to remind ourselves how fragile our existence really is. We fast to free our time for Bible study and prayer. We fast to strengthen ourselves spiritually. The day of the Lord will be a difficult time. We will need all the spiritual strength we can get. We also fa uh, fast as an act of mourning or grief. We mourn over the destruction that must come upon the earth because of sin. We fast, fast as an act of repentance, recognizing, excuse me, recognizing our sin and turning from it. We fast recognizing the day of the Lord will be a worldwide crisis. We fast so that God will hear our earnest prayer and he will forgive our sin, protect us from harm, and grant us safe passage to our promised land, the kingdom of God. Yes, it takes self-discipline to complete a fast. It's a task that's easily understood but sometimes difficult to implement. But I want to assure everyone that fasting is worth it. We've seen there are many benefits to fasting, both physical and spiritual. For our last scripture, let's turn to Zechariah chapter 8, verse 19. That's Zechariah chapter 8, verse 19. After the captivity, Israel had instituted many national fasts on their calendar. They remember the horrible events that led up to their captivity with a scheduled fast. They had fast in the fourth month, the fifth month, and the tenth month, in addition, of course, to the Day of Atonement in the seventh month. The Lord showed, excuse me, the Lord showed through Zechariah that one day we'll, we will not have to fast anymore, sooner than how the disciples did not fast when Jesus was with them. And that day our fast will be replaced with joy. Again, Zechariah 8, verse 19. Zechariah 8, verse 19. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the fast of the fourth month and the fast of the fifth and the fast of the seventh and the fast of the tenth shall be to the house of Judah joy and gladness and cheerful feasts. Therefore love the truth and peace. Thus says the Lord of hosts, it shall yet come to pass that there shall come people and the inhabitants of many cities and the inhabitants of one city shall go to another, saying, Let us go speedily to pray before the Lord and to seek the Lord of hosts. I will go also. Yea, many people and strong nations will come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to pray before the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, In those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold out of all languages of the nations 
even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, We will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Now this, of course, takes place in the kingdom of God. All people will turn toward Jerusalem to learn the ways of the learn of the Lord and his ways. <clears throat> we'll no longer need to fast quite like we did before, because at that point we're becoming truly to be at one with God. But for now, we rehearse that future fulfillment of the Day of Atonement by fasting on that high day. And again, we'll be right here at 1.30 Eastern Daylight Time on Wednesday, October 5th, as we fast and observe the Day of Atonement. And we hope to see you then.